And, uh, and then, um, but again, we can, do it, we can be pretty comfortable with natural uh, renewable resources if we do things like build little furniture out of bamboo and set our, set our food up that we don't want to leave on the ground up on tables to keep it away from rats and things like that. Just the basics of how we run a camp. Okay, so let's talk about the actual work here. So our, our good friend Vicente Angente, the, the master Varanus biologist that I told you about, um, always starts or orienting a new group of field assistants or students by saying the most important thing to doing biodiversity surveys is to start, before you start the work, is actually to do some surveys. And so um, here's a picture of, of one of our assistants and some students planning out an area around our field site. And, and just like we heard earlier, the most important thing um, for us is to sort of figure out the lay of the land and do some scouting around the general area. And we want to know where all the streams are, and we want to know where the different types of microhabitats are. And we want to know the spots where the forest is dry, like up on top of ridges. And we want to know if there's any swamps or streams or seeps nearby. And we want to know where it's muddy. And we want to know where it's rocky. Because all of those things mean different species. And it's all about habitats and microhabitats when it comes to amphibians and reptiles. The more of those distinct microhabitat types we can find, the more of those we want to target. If our, if our objective, again, is to record the presence of every species that's in the local area. So we start a survey with the survey, and the survey is just of all the habitat diversity in the local area. The air, and by local area, I mean the, the area that we can, as human beings, reach on foot in a day, do some work at, and then come back. So an area that's a matter of you know, probably 10 kilometers from your camp, you know, an area. And then when it's time to move farther up the mountain, we move the whole camp up so that we can survey down, downhill and uphill from that second camp. And then we might move everything up another, th a third site if we're on a big mountain that's 2,000 meters. We might move up to a high elevation site and have access to 200 meters downhill, 200 meters uphill, and stagger our field sites at, at multiple elevational increments, basically. Okay, and so, um, so there are lots of standardized methods for sampling amphibians and reptiles. Um, and we will do some of those this week, like drift fence and pitfalls, and other methods for, um, for passive methods for capturing things. And again, those, those are great for the, if we, our objective is to, is to sample diversity and make estimates of total species diversity on the basis of those samples. But when we're, when we're doing inventory work, we really are, are just trying to record every species that's there. And so we are, as Town said earlier, we're cutting between the habitat types, we're traversing everything on foot, we're searching the habitat, just looking through every nook and cranny of the forest raking leaf litter, looking in tree holes, climbing up in trees, using binoculars to look up in trees and see if we can th see things. Everything we can think of for, for looking around the forest, and we do it at different times of the day. It turns out that these nocturnal searches good, are often the most productive, because um, all the amphibians are active at night, and we can also often also see lots of the reptiles sleeping at night. That's not true for everything. There certainly are lots of reptile species that if you only went out at night, you would never see. There's lots that, you, that are active during the day, and then they sleep high up in the trees where we can't find them. But there are a lot of, there's a lot of reptile diversity that we actually see at night. Snakes feeding, um, lizards sleeping in trees, chameleons around here are easy to find at night. So there is a lot of nocturnal activity. Good. Um, and so by, again, by focusing really on the habitat types, we can really um, sample that diversity. So here's a little small stream in the Philippines, and our guards really helped us um, in this site uh, helped us sample diversity. And we found in these types of streams that have like this much water and little riffles of smooth gravel that we found whole completely different species of frogs. And the tadpoles that lived in this gravel, these gravelly riv rivers were very different than the tadpoles in the river that were just 50 meters away in a big river. So each of these different types of distinct habitat types are really important. So um, when we get out, sort of the first couple days are like are, uh, are this incredibly fun time where we're just going everywhere we can to try to figure out how many species are there. And we see more species per unit of time in the first couple of days because we're just exploring the whole general area and capturing everything we can see. And, um, and so here I am sampling even in, in, a, um, in a little thing, like a little pool in a rotten log. This is really um, high acidity water. It's been sitting here. It's dark color. Um, and it's been sitting here like a little fermenting pond inside a rotten log. And there's species of frogs that will only lay their, their eggs and, and rear their, the, the tadpoles will only live in this type of habitat that's really high acidic water in the dark. 
and the tadpoles may be unpigmented because they never come in contact with light. Um, there are species that are only found in these tiny microhabitats. Um, and then just going out with students and sampling all these areas at night. And also, but we, we do the same thing during the day, go to the same areas because you might be able to see a particular species um, during the day that you might not be able to see at night. So here's an example of a really specialized species. This is a, a toad of the genus Ansonia in Southeast Asia. Um, and for a long time, I didn't know much about their biology and didn't know where, I knew where to find the adults, but I couldn't find the offspring. I didn't know where they laid their eggs. And our goal with amphibians is both to survey the, the adults and the larvae, right? And they have this biphasic lifestyle where there's larvae usually in the water and then they, they go through metamorphosis and hatch into toads and frogs. Well, this one, go ahead, um, has, has, has a has a tadpole that has, uh, basically has a big sucker on, the, on its ventral surface and has these elaborate mouth parts and it hangs onto rocks in the fastest moving part of the stream. So like in a fast running stream in the white water, the only place you can find the tadpoles is in, is in this really rapidly cascading um, white water. And when we figured that out, then we could really concentrate on that tiny little microhabitat of the fastest part of the running stream to find the larvae of, the, of this tadpole of that, of that species of toad. It's very exciting. And there are toads here um, that we will see, right? That we'll see here that probably are... Um, yeah, we probably won't see them, but for those of you that are interested in herbs, Wernaria is a okay, toad genus that's endemic to Cameroon and Equatorial Guinea. Uh, I have tadpoles that are very similar to this. And there's actually just up hill somewhere from here, there's a waterfall, am I right, nearby Boya, um, where there's a pipe locality for a toad that has a tadpole just like this. So there, there are sort of Asian and African analogs of the same uh, highly specialized microhabitat type for the larvae. Go ahead, next. Slide. And so here we are trying to, this is a lot of fun once you figure it out, trying to, um, trying to catch the tadpole on the rock with one person you know, holding their, their hand so they can scoop it up and then the other person trying to catch that little tadpole. Pretty slippery and pretty fun to do this actually. But then the next day, you know, we sort of have this big catch of stuff of frogs and lizards and snakes. Um, and we spent a lot of time looking at them and trying to sort them out and figure out who's who. And if we have some literature, we might key them out and try to figure, figure out how many species we have with us. And we start making our lists of each species that we've encountered. And then I want to just talk about photography. And we're going to talk a lot about the data tomorrow. Um, so I won't go into too much detail. But I just wanted to show you um, a number of pictures of, of how, I guess, to sort of to characterize how important the photography is now for these species. Um, uh, let's see, for, so first off, we often have, especially with amphibians and reptiles, which are unlike the birds you heard about earlier, um, the identification of a lot of these, a lot of the diversity that we'll encounter is a lot more tenuous. And we have lots and lots of, of tentatively identified species in our lists. And we're not exactly sure what they are until we get them home and we do the genetic studies or we analyze our calls or we get to compare them to other museum specimens. But the first off, it's often really difficult. So we spend a lot of time trying to do the basic documentation so we have the information later to, 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 to attempt the proper identifications. So I spend a lot of time photographing things, especially, of course, if I think it may be a new species or something I've never seen before. Because one of the most frequent requests I get from biodiversity online information products is, can you send me photographs of the t these 10 or 15 species of frogs? And sometimes I can say yes, and sometimes I, I can't. Um, but what I try to do is make sure we get good, decent photographs of everything. And we'll talk more about the data that are associated with photog photo photography tomorrow, but go ahead. So, um, and this is a fun group effort. And here's a friend, Nikki and Kester, photographing a really rare species of snake that we just saw a couple of months ago in the, in the Philippines. And you can see they brought a white background. So we take pictures of them on a natural background, like the last photograph you just saw or on a, a white background, so we have multiple types of photographs. And, and just by putting them on different backgrounds, it emphasizes different things like their color pattern or what they might look like in the wild when you catch them or encounter them the first time. Go ahead. So here's that same species. Um, sometimes having a, a really white background allows you to identify things like the differences in the colors, the colors here, and the shapes and the, the rugosity of the scale pattern are things that might show up on a white background. And then we just like to have nice photographs, and we're just going to flip through a couple here that just show you some nice-looking, handsome animals on different backgrounds. Um, and the white background ones are really popular just because they, people like them for field guides, and they're really great on a web page or whatever. But, um, but another thing that's really important to do is associate the specimen 
with the catalog number and take the, pro the, top, the proper dorsal ventral sort of clinical document photographs that we'll need. If this turns out to be a new species, and this one actually did, you're going to want to have high quality dorsal ventral pictures and pictures of the things like the iris that Mark mentioned earlier or these color patterns because those things will fade once the animal has been preserved. So um, we do a lot of photography that's not, they're not handsome photographs, but they're really important for documenting the morphological diversity. But we also like to have lots of high quality pictures of things that look live. And these are the pictures that you might want to have in a field guide um, and show things like the bright blue eye on this agamid lizard and, and other features that are important for its identification. So here I am again photographing a, um, this is a Sicilian on a gray background. And then the, the resulting photograph, this one's a little, oh, it is a little dark. But you know, a close up of something like a Sicilian, a close up portrait of a Sicilian. In this case, I tried to get the head and the tail, both of which have a lot of taxonomic characters for identification. Um, a close up of, of these rare animals that you hardly ever get a chance to see is really valuable. So here's a couple other various images of specimens in trays. And you can see um, uh, things like the tags that go with each specimen. And the hemipenes have been averted on this snake. These are all things about how we prepare specimens that we'll talk about later. But let's just go scroll through a couple. Agamid lizards. These are flying lizards of the genus Draco. And you can see how carefully I've prepped them with their, their wings open so they can be studied because the color patterns of the wings are really important. These are, uh, and then a bunch of, that's fine. Um, and of course, these are, again, they're related to the agamas that you have around here. They're in the family Agamidae. But these are ones that have um, these wings, these patagia that open up that are supported by their sternal ribs. Anyway, go ahead. More pictures of specimens. Keep going. Um, snakes. I like to coil snakes into this rug formation, we call it, with the head on the outside. And if we do it really well and prepare them really nicely, it's a pleasure then to go back to the specimen and do things like count scales because we've prepped them in the, in the right form, the position. And same with you know, a frog. We like to put them in this position that looks like they're jumping and spread the fingers and toes because those are the positions we'd want them in if, we, if we're using calipers and trying to take measurements from the specimens later. We want to have them in all in the same position um, so that it's very easy to take measurements from them and those measurements um, are comparable between the specimens. And on a busy area in a site where you're having, where there's lots and lots of diversity and a number of people working, you can have a very heavy workload. These are all specimens that were prepped this afternoon that are all in Tupperware hardening in formalin. I like this picture just because it shows the amount of the volume of, um, of material that's coming in in a really productive site with a lot of people working together. Um, this is like on the second day at one of those sites where we had six or eight people working together. And, uh, and those first initial days where you're just scrambling through all the habitat types trying to record specimens. And this is an area I was just telling Dave about this earlier. This is one of my favorite field camps of all time. And it's because the, um, the guard, the forest guards in this area caught an um, illegal logger who was, who was cutting down um, some Kaingan area, an area where he was going to do slash and burn agriculture. But first he was cutting down the trees and making um, and selling the timber. So they caught him and then they had all this lumber and the guards made us these beautiful tables that we could work at. I mean, this is like a, you know, this is like my desk at home, basically, a really comfortable place to work. Um, and then they turned this area into a guard outpost on the edge of the forest after we left. And they used those tables um, as the guards were working there to protect the forest. So keep going. So here's a picture. Um, one of the things we like to do is just look at the animals really carefully in life before we preserve them. And so I take color notes on them um, or color pattern differences that have never been reported <laughs> from the literature. Keep going. We, take, we collect ancillary data. So these are a couple students in the Philippines who are swabbing frogs to collect um, bacterial and viral um, samples from their skin. In this case, um, this is um, uh, sampling for chytrid fungus. And so every frog is being swabbed to sample for these emerging infectious pathogens that are causing chytridomycosis. Go ahead. And then this is one where you have to, can you get it? Nope, you have to do this. There you go. So we'll talk more about data tomorrow, but I just wanted to show you sort of my workspace at a typical site. There's all my tags and my tissues that I'm taking at any given time, my coffee cup, <laughs> my field notes. There's the chytrid swabs, right? There's the specimens in the tray to the right. Here are the next specimens being processed in plastic bags that are waiting, standing by, um, and, uh, and they're waiting to be swabbed. And then here's my assistant, Jason, putting lotion on his legs. We can go ahead. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> OK. So, um, uh, so here's a, a photograph of some, of some of our assistants helping by sorting specimens um, 
according to their species, to which species they are in the field. And this is a very sort of interesting exercise to do if you're working with local stakeholders or area people who live around a protected area or a potential protected area, is just to have, ask people to, when you have a bunch of specimens in plastic bags, to tell, ask them to go through the process of sorting them out according to what species they think they are. And often the, their results of doing that exercise are really different than our results as scientists. And so that's what these guys are doing. Um, some people who essentially grew up as farmers around this protected area who are now being enlisted to be forest wardens and um, people who participate in the, um, the protection of the forest but also interacting with the local communities around it. Um, and then of course when we find something really exciting, a discovery, we sort of take a break from a lot of the work and, 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 and spend a lot of time photographing rare things. So this is a rare Sicilian from the southwestern Philippines. And you know, once we caught these things and figured out how to catch them, figured out what their microhabitat was so we knew where to target, we spent a day really targeting that area and collecting a number of specimens. And then we spent the whole afternoon photographing them because it was super exciting. Um, and so those things come up and they, they get, in the way of the, of, get in the way of the work, if you will, but they're also part of it. So as, as Town mentioned earlier, if you have that goal in mind of doing a, a proper inventory and recording all the species that are present, you have to be careful about the distractions, even the good ones, when it comes to things like this. Keep going. Yeah. 